Hello, thank you for joining with me. We are reading with the Course Companions group out of Chapter 15, The Holy Instant and Special Relationships. Today we are in Section 8, The Escape from Loneliness. This is Day 201 with the Course Companions group. And we are reading out of A Course in Miracles, Complete and Annotated Edition, edited by Robert Perry. And this Course Companions commentary will be by Robert Perry, but the group was put together by Emily Bennington. And I, if you will please close your eyes and join me in prayer. Dear God, if left to my own devices, my perception will be skewed. I surrender to you everything that I think and feel. God, please take my past, plan my future, send your spirit to redeem my mind that I might be set free. May I be your channel, God, and serve the world. May I become who you would have me be, do what you would have me do, go where you would have me go, and say what you would have me say and to whom. God, please enable me to set aside everything I think I know about everything, God. Please allow me an open mind and a new experience. Grace me with childlike vision. Amen. Thank you so much for joining with me. And now, I will read this section. Section 8, The Escape from Loneliness. But remember this, to be a body is not communication. And if you think it is, you will feel guilty about communication and will be afraid to hear the Holy Spirit recognizing in His voice your own need to communicate. The Holy Spirit cannot teach through fear. Footnote 34. Oh, where is it? Oh, I'm sorry, I passed it. This appears to... It's half the page. This appears to mean that the Holy Spirit cannot reach you through the barrier of your fear of Him. And you fear Him because you see communication with Him from the perspective of your experience with body-based relationships. You therefore expect him to use guilt to obliterate, to obligate you to sacrifice for him. Forgive me, <laughs> not obliterate. You therefore expect him, the Holy Spirit, to use guilt to obligate you to sacrifice for him. And how can he communicate with you while you believe that to communicate is to make yourself alone? It is clearly insane to believe that by communicating you will be abandoned, and yet you do believe it. 35. The reason why you believe that by communicating you will be abandoned was explained in the previous section. Real communication releases another from guilt. And you believe that guilt is the only thing that keeps that person from leaving you. What, you. what releases him from guilt is bad because he would no longer believe that bodies communicate and so he would be gone. For you think that your mind must be kept private or you will lose it. Yet if bodies are together, your mind remains your own. 36. The principle here seems to be that you project onto other minds what you believe about your own. You believe your own mind must be kept private or you will lose it. Lose control of it as your own private possession. You therefore believe that another's mind must also be kept private, locked in his body, rather than joined with other minds in communication, or you will lose that other mind. You will no longer control it as your own private possession, because now it will be an unbounded reality, unconfined to a particular body. Union of bodies thus becomes the way in which you would keep minds apart, for bodies cannot forgive. They can do only as the mind directs. The illusion of the autonomy of the body and its ability to overcome loneliness is but the working of the ego's plan to establish its own autonomy. As long as you believe that to be with a body is companionship, 
you will be compelled to attempt to keep your brother in his body, held there by guilt, and you will see safety in guilt and danger in communication. For the ego will always teach that loneliness is solved by guilt, and that communication is the cause of loneliness. And despite the evident insanity of the, this lesson, you have learned it. Forgiveness lies in communication as surely as damnation lies in guilt. It is the Holy Spirit's teaching function to instruct those who believe that communication is damned. I'm sorry, is damnation. That communication is salvation. And he will do so for the power of God in him and you are joined in real relationship so holy and so strong that it can overcome even this without fear. It is through the holy instant that what seems impossible is accomplished, making it evident that it is not impossible. In the holy instant, guilt holds no attraction since communication has been restored, and guilt whose only purpose is to disrupt communication has no function there. Here there is no concealment and no private thoughts. The willingness to communicate attracts communication to it and overcomes loneliness completely. There is complete forgiveness here for there is no desire to exclude anyone from your completion in sudden recognition of the value of his part in it. In the protection of your wholeness, all are invited and made welcome. And you understand that your completion is God's, whose only need is to have you be complete. For your completion makes you His in your awareness. And here it is that you experience yourself as you were created and as you are. The holy instant does not replace the need for learning, for the Holy Spirit must not leave you as your teacher until the holy instant has extended far beyond time. For a teaching assignment such as his, he must use everything in this world for your release. He must side with every sign and token of your willingness to learn of him what truth must be. He is swift to utilize whatever you offer him on behalf of this. His concern and care for you are limitless in the face of your fear of forgiveness, which he perceives as clearly as he knows forgiveness is release. He will teach you to remember always that forgiveness is not your loss, but your salvation, and that in complete forgiveness, in which you recognize at last that there is nothing to forgive, you are absolved completely. Hear him gladly and learn of him that you have need of no special relationships at all. You but seek in them what you have thrown away, and through them you will never learn the value of what you have cast aside, but what you still desire with all your heart. Let us join together in making the holy instant all that there is, by desiring that it be all that there is. God's Son has such great need of your willingness to strive for this that you cannot conceive of need so great. Behold the only need that God and His Son share and will to meet together. You are not alone in this. The will of your creations calls to you to share your will with them. Turn then in peace from guilt to God and them. Relate only with what you will never, I'm sorry, relate only with what will never leave you and what you cannot leave. The loneliness of God's Son is the loneliness of His Father. Refuse not the awareness of your completion and seek not to restore it to yourself. Fear not to give redemption over to your Redeemer's love. He will not fail you, for he comes from one who cannot fail. Accept your sense of failure as nothing more than a mistake in who you are. For the holy host of God is beyond failure, and nothing that he wills can be denied. 
You are forever in a relationship so holy that it calls to everyone to escape from loneliness and join you in your love. And where you are, must everyone seek and find you there. Think but an instant on this. God gave the sonship to you to ensure your perfect creation. This was his gift, for as he withheld himself not from you, he withheld not his creation. Nothing that was ever created but is yours. Your relations are with the universe. And this universe, being of God, is far beyond the petty sum of all the separate bodies you perceive. For all its parts are joined in God through Christ, where they become like to their Father. For Christ knows of no separation from his Father, who is one relationship in which he gives as his Father gives to him. The Holy Spirit is God's attempt to free you of what he does not understand. And because of the source of the attempt, it will succeed. The Holy Spirit asks you to respond as God does, for he would teach you what you do not understand. God would respond to every need, whatever form it takes. And so he has kept this channel open to receive his communication to you and yours to him. God does not understand your problem in communication, for he does not share it with you. It is only you who believe that it is understandable. The Holy Spirit knows that it is not understandable, and yet he understands it because you have made it. In him alone lies the awareness of what God cannot know and what you do not understand. It is his holy function to accept them both, and by removing every element of disagreement to join them into one. He will do this because it is his function. Leave then what seems to you to be impossible to him who knows it must be possible because it is the will of God. And let him whose teaching is only of God teach you the only meaning of relationships. For God himself created the only relationship that has meaning, and that is his relationship with you. And now I will read Robert Perry's commentary on this section. This is one of those sections that can easily go by in a blur. It begins with some hard to decipher material about communication and bodies, and then goes into very, some very abstract material about the holy instant. As always with the Course, though, this section contains vital teaching for us. The open paragraph sketch two modes of relationship. In the usual mode, you just want to be another body. Sitting next to that body, going to dinner with that body, having sex with that body. That's your idea of companionship. In this mode, you don't want a real joining of minds. Indeed, you want to keep your mind private and maintain tight control over it. And you want to keep your partner's mind locked inside his body and maintain control over it. As yesterday's section taught, you exercise this control through guilt. If the other person always owes you, if his debt is never paid, then his body can never leave. It is vital, therefore, in this mode, that you do not release from him his debt. For what then would possibly hold him to you? This fear, though, is really just the tip of the iceberg. Releasing him from his debt is part of a whole other mode of relationship. In this mode, you are uninterested in keeping his body chained to yours. What you want is the joining of minds. You realize that your mind is not, not private. It's not really confined to your body. And you know that the same is true of his mind. What you want, then, is to release his mind from its chains, its debt to you, so that both minds can rise from their lonely cells and unite directly, without the encumbrance of bodies. This sounds great on paper, but if you are really honest, I think you will detect a voice in you that is somewhat uneasy about this prospect. It's all well and good to have a warm feeling about minds being one, but what if, in this wonderful state of freedom, 
your partner's body just gets up and walks away. If his mind is not a private entity, how can you control what it wants to do? And if your mind is not a private entity, how can it be your private possession? This new mode then could mean that you lose his body, his mind, and your mind. Exactly. I can. That's what I was sharing about yesterday. Our attachments to the ego's mode of relationship run very deep. We are not going to shake loose of them overnight. That's why it's so reassuring to hear that the Holy Spirit is 100% invested in getting us there. He must side with every sign and our token of your willingness to learn of him what the truth must be. He is swift to utilize whatever you offer on behalf of this. His concern and care for you are limitless. It's okay if we're ambivalent. I'm sorry. The fact that he is not means that we will get there, no matter how ambivalent we are. In the meantime, we need to face the fact that being with a body doesn't solve our loneliness, which I think all of us know that. Even when that body is there all the time, we can still be profoundly lonely. As Jesus so poignantly puts it later in the text, And so they wander through a world of strangers unlike themselves, living with their bodies perhaps beneath a common roof that shelters neither in the same room and yet a world apart. Could it be that the real solution to our loneliness lies in stepping out of our body-centric mode of relating altogether? The benefits of that other mode can seem too good to be true. Look at paragraph 8, for instance. It says that just as God gave himself to us when he created us, so he gave us every mind he ever created. Think about that. It means that every single person that exists in a very real sense is yours. It means that you have a deep relationship of all mutual belongings with every single one of them. Of mutual belonging with every single one of them. With Jesus, with the Dalai Lama, with that person who never returned your love, with your estranged friend, with your enemy. Every single one of them belongs to you as God's gift to you, and you belong to them. If that is really true, doesn't that change things? As is always the case of cha in chapter 15, we experience this in the holy instant. It gives us a foretaste of that other mode. It is where we learn just how desirable that other mode is. In the meantime, we can cultivate our desire for that mode, seeing in it our real escape from loneliness. And we can cultivate our desire for the holy instant. We can join with Jesus in making the holy instant all that there is by desiring that it be all that there is. Thank you so much for joining with me in this section. Day 101 of the Course Companions Reading Schedule, Section 8, The Escape from Loneliness. I love you.